Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to worship here at Woodlawn. We invite you to stand with us this morning as we sing and worship the Lord. Open my 
to believe Wake my soul Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord Praise the Lord With all of my heart With all of my strength With all that I have I will sing it It's a newer song, but it's written to sound like a much older hymn. And with that comes a little bit of kind of funny wordplay sometimes. And, and I don't want us to miss just how good these words are and what hope and what assurance and what excitement they can bring for us this Sunday morning. What, as I always say, you don't know what somebody else in this room is going through. And what hearing you sing the truth of these words can do to encourage, to remind someone of what Christ has done for them. So my encouragement as always is to sing, but also my encouragement this morning is let's really pay attention to these words. And I just wanted to read through the words of this first verse. It's, a, it's kind of a call and response. It's ask a question and then it gives an answer every time. So it says, what is our hope in life and death? The answer, Christ alone, Christ alone. What is our only confidence? that our souls to him, Christ Jesus, is who it belongs. 
Who holds our days within his hands? What comes apart? What comes apart from his demand, a command? Excuse me. So that's saying what comes, what happens? Nothing outside of Christ commanding it to happen. And what will keep us to the end? It's the love of Christ in which we stand. And then we get to go on and sing hallelujah to the, to the Savior whose kingdom that we worship, that we are a part of. So I encourage you this morning that sing loud. I don't care if you can't carry a tune in a bucket. Jesus doesn't either. It's about singing out. And I, I know that somebody in this room this morning is not having the best of days. And what a great reminder. Who holds our days within his hands? Jesus does. He is our hope in Christ alone, in his life and in his death. So I encourage you to sing out. Let's encourage each other this morning and the hope and the assurance that we have in Jesus.
Well, good morning. Y'all have a seat. Let me try it again. That was kind of weird, wasn't it? Good morning. morning. It's good to see you guys. Kind of like weird whenever I start walking up and David starts talking. We make eyes. What are you doing? So it's good to see you guys this morning. Uh, Last week, if you were here, we talked about prayer concerns. We were going to preteen camp. God answered prayers. We had four preteeners except Christ this week. Yeah, that's good. Another prayer request is David and Tim were going to be in charge around here. And I walked in on Wednesday. I said, hey, David, how'd everything go this week? And he goes, it was perfect. The Methodists have accepted us into their, uh, in, into their denomination. So I think he was kidding. But uh, all is good. David did it. They, they said no. They said no. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for praying this week. We had a great week at camp. It was hot. Uh, but it was fantastic. And I, just a quick story to tell you that, that I think is awesome. We sang this morning in the early service, uh, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I love that so much. I grew up with <laughs> Richard's not on a, on a microphone. He wanted you to know that he loves that song uh, so much. He, he grew up with it. Yes. Richard, anything else you'd like to share with the group? <laughs> I'm going to go watch that. <laughs> so... Anyway, as, as we got the, <laughs> I've been at camp, man. I've been at camp. I've been at camp. So, uh, <laughs> and you've got a Band-Aid on your head. Are you okay? If okay. you would like to get your phone out, you can text. <laughs> so anyway, I want to share, I want to tell this story. So we sang this song about Sweet, Sweet Spirit in this place. And whenever I came to Woodlawn eight and a half years ago, one of the people on the search committee said, hey, we're a, we are a non-conflicted church. And, and honestly, I laughed inside because no Baptist church is non-conflicted. I mean, that's like, that's oxymoron. But after eight and a half years, I'm like, this is a really, really good place. I mean, there had been a lot of conflict in eight and a half years. Well, we're standing in line to get coffee at preteen camp. Yes, there's a coffee shop. There's a pool. There's a lake where you can slide down the slide. There's food. You don't have to cook and you don't have to clean up. Anybody want to volunteer now? This is your chance. So anyway, we're in line at this coffee shop, and this lady says, now, where are you from? And I said, well, Woodlawn in Austin. And she said, well, what do you do for a living? (laughs) In my mind, I'm thinking, I'm a hot air balloon driver, you know, what can I, anyway, I said, well, I'm the pastor at the church. And and she said, oh, cool. Well, then she's like, I think she has Stephanie, or, and she said, well, what do you do? Well, Stephanie said, well, I'm the children's pastor. Well, that's normal. It's children's camp. You're supposed to be there. Well, then she moves to Ethan. Well, what do you do? What does a youth guy do, right? I mean, <laughs> eat donuts, play games. Anyway, he said, well, I'm the youth pastor. She was amazed. And then we continued on and said, well, our executive pastor is down in his room taking a nap right now, but he's here with us too. Um, and so, wow. So anyway... She said, you know, I, we can't even get a staff member from our church to come to camp. And I thought, Man, that's sad. But here's, here's why I tell you this. The, the cool part about our staff is we were there at camp and we all enjoyed being with each other at camp. And it was fun for us to be there. I think we all like each other. I like them. They seem to like each other. They may not like me, but they don't tell me. But I, you know, I, I was so thankful, one, that you as a church, we are comfortable leaving David Wall in charge and, and y'all being okay with him here, but that we have an opportunity to go pour into our kids. And Ethan said, those are going to be my kids one day. I need to get to know them. Stephanie's pouring into those kids, getting to know them as they're in her ministry. But I, I just, I'm thankful for our church. And sometimes we don't stop down and say that, but I really am. For who we are as Woodlawn, you guys are amazing, and, and I'm thankful that we know when we ask you to pray, you pray, you give so that these kids can go to camp, so many things that you're a part of, and so thank you for what you do and who you are. I just wanted to say that this morning. So now I'll get back on track. Uh, my sermon's kind of short today, so we're okay. Uh, if you haven't checked in, let me encourage you to do so. We welcome you to Woodlawn. We're so glad you guys are here. If you haven't checked in, let me ask you to do that. You type in 512 777 they're back. 2944. Uh, they were out last week. They're back. Uh, it, type in the word check in the text message line. Hit send, and it will take you to an opportunity for you to check in to worship here at the 1111 hour. If you're at home, you can check in for the 1111 hour. It'll also take you to sermon notes for today. It will take you to announcements for today. And it'll take you to a page that shows you opportunities, ways you can give to support the ministry of Woodlawn. 
Speaking of announcements, so on September 4th, we are going to have our Splash Bash. We've been doing this for several years now. It's down in Buda at Twin Oaks Ranch. It's a great time. There's a pool there. We'll have burgers cooked, hot dogs cooked. It's going to be a great time of fellowship. Indoors, there will be uh, games. You can bring games to play. There's a, an air-conditioned place that's very comfortable. There's a river. The, it's a creek. Onion Creek runs through there. We think there's still some water in that. We'll see how that goes on September 4th. But we're going to have a great time of fellowship as a church family. So mark your calendar for September 4th so you can come be a part of that. It's going to be awesome. going to be a great day. Another opportunity to fellowship with people is coming up next week, August 8th to the 12th. We're going to be doing some construction work uh, in our West Hall. And so if you're interested in coming and helping with that, it's sheetrock. It's tearing out uh, ceiling tiles, tearing out the ceiling, doing some painting, things like that. All people are welcome to come. If you aren't able to do any construction work, you can go buy tacos for us, okay? So there's something for every, that was a joke. There's something for everybody to come do. Uh, it's August 8th to the 12th. If you're interested in doing that, you can let Lane know. He's right here on row number two. Or you can text to 512-777-2944 the word project and get signed up uh, through that way. It's going to be a great time of fellowship as well as getting some work done on the building. It's going to be a great time. So hopefully you'll do that. Richard, are you, anything else? There. You'll be there. Richard will be there. Anything else? Okay, David, let's worship. <laughs>
out this morning. We've seen a move.
of our hope in your life what you did on this earth and in your death what you did for us on the cross and Jesus that you didn't stay dead that you were resurrected that to this day this very moment you are alive and well and so we get to sing oh what a savior isn't he wonderful Jesus, we find ourselves, we can write so many words to so many songs and they will still fall short of what you have done for us, of who you are. And so we, we just simply come, we, we, we want the words of these songs, the cry of our heart, just to be a sweet sound in your ear. We want to continue to worship you as we dive into your word, as we look at the old, old worship songs, the old psalms. Jesus, how you have redeemed my life out of the pit. That no matter what struggles we may face, you are bigger, you are stronger, you are greater. God, we have seen you move and we know that you will do it again in big ways and in small ways. Would you move in us this morning that we could leave this place, that we could leave this place looking and thinking and acting and loving just a little bit more like you. It's in Jesus' name. Let's take a look at our verse of the week from last week. It was Isaiah 40, verse 29. It said, He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Truly, He does. Amen? And then this week, 
We move to the Psalms for one of the first verses that I ever memorized as a child. Psalm 119.11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. One of the uh, verses that, that is in that, that Psalm as well says, how can a young man keep his way pure by keeping it according to thy word? Well, if we don't hide his word in our heart, how can we live it out if we don't know it? So if we want to keep our way pure, we have to do it by keeping it according to thy word. So we need to hide his word in our heart. Let that be a challenge to all of us this week. So if you got your Bible, let's go to Psalms chapter 40. The 40th Psalm is where we go this morning. If you remember last week, we talked about baby Jessica in Midland, Texas, and being rescued from the well at her aunt's house. Some of you were familiar with that story when I said it. Others of you read about it while I preached. I'm well aware of that. Hopefully by now you all know the story of baby Jessica in Midland. If you don't, then now you're free to go Google it. But now you're going to have another story to Google. In 2010, there were 33 Chilean miners that were trapped in a mining shaft for 69 days. Now, think about that for just a minute. That is a long time to be trapped. 69 days. The world watched. The world waited. The world wondered, would these miners be rescued? And they were. On day 69, they were rescued and they were brought to the surface of the earth. And a Chilean government official very boldly proclaimed that the miners were rescued by divine providence. Now, now amen is one thing if we know that. But here's what was interesting to me. As you read that, he had been asking for prayers. Why is it when God does something incredible, the world wants to say, well, a divine providence was involved? Why can't we just say, to God be the glory, that our God rescued those miners? It's interesting. But what also happened, just as with baby Jessica, the world erupted with celebration. I mean, it was like, let's rejoice. The miners have been rescued. Everything is fantastic. Everything is wonderful there was reason for rejoicing. Now, last week, if you were here, we left off with verse 10 in Psalm 40, and we left with David celebrating and proclaiming God's goodness. But as is the case with David, and as is the case with many of us, David lived this roller coaster life with the Lord. Things would be good, and then things would be bad. As we pick up verse 11, it's really interesting in music, there's an ability that a composer, if he wants to add a haunting element to a song or a score, they change it to the minor key. It can just be happily going along, and all of a sudden they go to the minor key, and it just goes dark. Well, that's what's interesting. As we go from chapter, Psalm chapter 40, verse 10, to verse 11, it's as if David hits a minor chord. The tone of the psalm completely changes. If you remember last week, David went from struggling to being committed to proclaiming God's goodness in verse 10. Then we get to verse 11, and he finds himself in a mess. David has gotten himself back in a big old ball of mess in one verse. This is what it says in verse 11. Now remember verse 10, he's proclaiming God's goodness. Verse 11, do not withhold your mercy from me, Lord. May your love and faithfulness always protect me, for troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me and I cannot see. Do not, they're, they're, they are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Be pleased to save me, Lord. Come quickly, Lord, to help me. Now, David has proclaimed that God has rescued him in the past, but he doesn't presume God's mercy here in the future. It's interesting. He doesn't presume that God is going to save him here. He's asking for that. He begins with a plea that says, please do not withhold your mercy from me. In the Hebrew, it is actually more of a confident statement. David says, 
I know you will not withhold your mercy from me. Now, here's what's interesting. Because we all get in trouble. We all have our moments that we're in the pit. And we pray, God, please help me. When we get in trouble, we cry out to God, help me. Why don't we cry out to him in good times? We, we wait for the bad, but we get to the, good, to the bad times, and we cry out, God, please show me mercy, help me. David's been in enough trouble through his life that he's confident here that God will show mercy. He's not asking for it. He's saying, I'm confident. In the Hebrew language, I am confident that you will not withhold your mercy. He's saying the same love, the same faithfulness that David has promised to publicly proclaim in verse 9 and 10. He now asks God for love and faithfulness and truth to continually protect him and preserve him. God, I need you to protect me. God, I need you to preserve me for who I am. God, I need you. He's crying out, I need you. Why? Because there are internal threats to his peace. There are internal threats to his peace. He's struggling with what's going on in his own life. He has this battle going on. He's overwhelmed with troubles. The scripture literally says they have surrounded him. The guilt, the shame of his past have now overtaken him. He has so many things that it outnumbers the hair on his head. Now, some guys were like, yeah, it's not as bad as it used to be. Jimmy Reed's good. He's set. <laughs> not a hair on his head. That's two. Okay. Did I get three? Okay, just checking. What's happening here is David is losing hope. David is absolutely losing hope. His heart has literally left him. Look at what it says. My heart fails within me. Some of your translations will say it has left me. His heart has failed. I am in serious trouble. I am being overwhelmed with what's going on. But here's what's interesting. This isn't the first time for David to be in this position. David has visited this pit many times. Psalm 69 says this. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths. Where there is no foothold, I have come into the deep waters. The floods engulf me. I am worn out calling for help. My throat is parched. My eyes fail looking for my God. This is not the first time that David's going, God, I need you. I'm in trouble. You know what I find in this? Hope. Because I am the same guy that walks into the pit, gets out of the pit, walks back in the pit, gets out of the pit, walks back in the pit. And you know what I find from David here? God's faithfulness. He doesn't leave us in the pit. He desires to pull us out. We have got to make some choices to avoid the pit. Those are decisions that we have to make. Because of God's love, because of his mercy, we can pray that God would take pleasure in saving us, in forgiving us, in healing us, in providing for us, and guiding us. What a beautiful thing David prays when he says, be pleased, Lord, to save me. Do you think of it as God being pleased when we ask him to guide us? Do you think of it as it's pleasing God to rescue us? Do we think of it as it's pleasing God when we cry out to him in times of need? It brings him pleasure. May it please you. What a beautiful word David gives here. You see, God has a desire for us to be spiritually well. God has a desire for us to be out of the pit. God has a desire for us to be healthy. David is showing a confident expectation. But now there's an urgency to it. He's patiently been waiting on the Lord. He says, I'm committed to the Lord. I've been rescued. I'm proclaiming you. All of that was patiently in verses 1 through 10. But now there's a sense of urgency. David's troubles are overwhelming him. And before he's patiently waiting, now he's praying, come quickly, Lord. I'm in serious trouble. I'm, I need your help. Come and help me. Come and save me. I am surrounded by my sin. Ever been there? ever been there up to your neck surrounded in the mire in the muck 
We all have been there at some point in time. We've cried out to this prayer to God. I'm at the rock bottom. I'm on the verge of my marriage falling apart. I'm on the verge of this depression taking me to deep, dark places that I don't know how to get out of. My life is falling apart. God, I need the doctor to call back with a different diagnosis because that one I don't like. God, I need that child. I want that child. God, I need my child to be saved. God, I need my spouse to be saved. I'm in the pit. I'm in trouble. I need help. We've all been there, right? (coughs) God is faithful. He's in the pit, and he's out of the pit too. He's faithful. Preteen camp got me. Sorry. He's faithful. But here's what I love about David. In the midst of him crying out, he makes a plea for his enemies. He makes a plea for his enemies. Look at what he says in verse 14 and 15. May all who want to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, be appalled at their own shame. In Psalm As David is in the midst of these inner internal struggles, the shame, the guilt of his past sins, but he's also dealing with an external struggle. You see, we we have these things that, that we battle with inside, but we still have the outside struggles going on. What's happening in David's past? What is he dealing with? Well, these verses are called, it's a big word, they're called imprecatory which in these Psalms, imprecatory means the writer is asking God to show vengeance towards their enemies. That's what David's doing here. He's saying, I want you to put all of my enemies to shame. I want you to embarrass them. I want you to humiliate them. Now, what does that do? Whenever we're wrong, what do we tend to want to do? Point the finger somewhere else, right? I'm not wrong. Look at what they did. It's their fault. They're the ones. We want to shuffle blame in a different direction. David takes it to a different level. Look at what Psalm 3, 7 says. Arise, Lord. Deliver me, my God. And then get this. He says, strike all of my enemies in the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. God, just take them out. I, I need to deal with what's on the inside of me, but I need you to take care of all the problems that are on the outside. Well, in Psalm 40, David is a little more subdued than what this verse is. But he's still counting on God to rescue him from his foes who want to take his life, who desire his ruin, and who mock him. David does something similar in Psalm 35, verse 4 through 6. May those who seek my life be disgraced and put to shame. May those who plot my ruin be turned back in dismay. May they be like chaff before the wind with the angel of the Lord driving them away. May their path be dark and slippery with the angel of the Lord pursuing them. David has this desire throughout his life. He had many enemies. King Saul, both of his sons desired to kill him. But he didn't seek revenge on them. He chose not to seek revenge on them. He asked God to take up his cause and to protect him and to shame his enemies. Now, what do we tend to want to do? I'll handle it. I'll break their jaw. David prayed for God to deal with them. David recognized, I need to deal with me, and then prayed, God, would you deal with them? You see, our tendencies are we want to deal with them and not have to worry about us. Our human nature is they're the problem, not me. But David, even in the pit, recognizes I'm the one who's wrong here. God, you break their jaw. Now, I'm not saying we need to pray for God to break somebody's jaw. That's not the right thing to pray. But God, deal with them in a spiritual sense. I'll take care of me spiritually. Lord, you work on them spiritually. Now, most of us don't have people trying to kill us. I don't think. We, we don't have anybody chasing after us to kill us. But I think that there may be some of us who feel like there are some who want to ruin us. Right? I mean, we, we live in a world today that we're afraid to post things on next door or on social media, because we know some will agree with us, but others are going to tear us apart. We, we live in Twitter beef wars, then we live in Facebook wars, and we live in next door wars, and we live even in church wars, wars sometimes. 
Everybody wants to be right. There are people who seek to ruin us. How do we handle that? How do we handle that? Do we want to break their jaw? Well, thankfully, Paul gives us some words in Romans chapter 12 that tells us what we need to do. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it's written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. So grab a hold of that for just a minute. If we're being told in Psalms by David, let me deal with me, let God deal with their jaw. And then Paul in Romans is telling us, if at all possible, leave it to God for the wrath. I think we need to put Psalms and Roman together and grab a hold of the idea, I need to deal with me and my heart and let God deal with them and their heart. But our flesh says otherwise, doesn't it? We want to attack. We want to tear down. We want to break jaws. In a world gone wrong, we're called to be agents of reconciliation. And when that doesn't happen, we have to leave it up to God to fight our battles. It's not our job to make someone else right. How do you speak to them? How do you care for them? Now, understand this. It doesn't mean we compromise what God's Word says. We stand on the Word of God, but when we stand on what God's Word says, we have to do it in a loving way. So often, we want to break their jaw and then tell them what God's Word says. Let's love them first. And then David continues on. As he gets to verse 16, he offers a praise for the redeemed. Remember, remember the roller coaster ride that David's always on? Well, here he is in the bottom of the pit. Hurry up, God. Hurry up, God. Hurry up, God. Then he says this in verse 16. It says this. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who long for your saving help always say, the Lord is great. Wait, is this the same guy? What, what happened here? May those who find you say, the Lord is great. In contrast to the people that oppose God, his people, and his ways, David prays for the one who seeks after God. In the midst of the pit, he's praying for them. In Psalm 9, David writes this. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Psalm 31, 7, he says this. I will be glad and rejoice in your love, for you saw my affliction and knew the anguish of my soul. What is their cry of praise? The Lord is great. Some translations say the Lord is magnified. The Lord is magnified. What is, what's David trying to say here? Even in the midst of the pit, I know that you can still work, God. I know you can still work. May you be magnified. Now, magnifying glasses are really cool. You know, talking about a little round, got a handle. I love magnifying glasses. I used to burn ant piles up with magnifying glasses. Don't do that today, anybody. Don't. But what's interesting is when you, when you take a magnifying glass and you look through it, does it make the object bigger? Wrong. Wrong. The object is still the same size. All the magnifying glass is doing is making it larger to see and clearer to see. The object doesn't change. The object stays the same. And so whenever we talk about magnifying God, what, Paul, what David is saying here is, may we see the Lord clearer. May we see him clearer. May, may we get a bigger picture of who God is. So when we're going through tough times, we're able to say, there's God. We recognize him. We know him. There he is. It's clear to us. Look at what Psalm 145.3 says. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. Magnify that. Blow it up. And then David has one last cry for rescue. He gets back to verse 17. He has one last cry, and he says this. But as for me, I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. You are my God. Do not delay. Again, he comes back to that urgency. David realizes that his help has to come from the outside of himself. 
I have tried this on my own. It doesn't work. It has to come from somewhere beyond me. He might be the king, but spiritually he sees himself as poor and needy and afflicted and destitute. He asked the Lord, would you think of me? Have you ever considered that the Lord think of you? That sounds really egotistical, doesn't it? In a world where so much is going on, Lord, think of me. He does. He knows your name. The Bible says he knows how many hairs are on your head. He knows everything about you. Lord, think of me. And so with confidence and expectation, David declares that the Lord is his help. You are my deliverer. You are my God. He cries that out. All throughout the Psalms, through all kinds of emotion, David affirms this again and again and again. Look at Psalm 18 too. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, my horn of salvation, my stronghold. Get a hold of it. Rock, fortress, deliverer, rock, refuge, shield, horn of salvation, stronghold. God, you are my God. I proclaim you. David begins the psalm waiting patiently, but he ends the psalm with an urgent cry for rescue. It has been said, God is, all, is, is never late, but he's rarely early. God is never late, but he's rarely early. God is always on time. Hurry, God. David says, hurry. God has a timing for everything. And sometimes whenever the diagnosis isn't what we want, sometimes when the child doesn't return back to the Lord, sometimes when that loved one passes away and we think it doesn't make sense and it doesn't add up, God is sitting there going, I have lessons to teach. My timing. Trust me. Trust me. What would you say to a person who's in the pit? If you came across somebody this afternoon that very clearly was in the pit, what would you say to them? Maybe you're in the pit this morning. What would I say to you? Next Sunday morning, we're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And we're going to take a little piece of cracker, and we're going to take a little cup of grape juice. But if I take a magnifying glass and I see that more clearly, what do I see? I see Jesus' body that's broken for me. I see his blood that was spilt for me. Preacher, what does that mean? This week at preteen camp, that's exactly what we talked about. Jesus loved you enough that he came to this filthy, nasty earth to die on a cross. An ugly wooden cross. They put nails through his wrist and through his feet for you, for you alone. If you're in the pit, hear that. He came for you. And then they took him off the cross when he was dead, and they put him in a tomb. And three days later, the power of his Father in heaven called him out. And he came back to life to pay the price for your sin. The Bible says we've all sinned. The Bible says we all have struggled. But the Bible also says that Jesus came to pay the price for that sin. That's what we tell people that are in the pit. Jesus is the answer. He's the hope. He's salvation. That's what, Paul, that's what David is saying. How great are you, Lord? Even before Jesus came, how great are you, Lord? You love me enough. A sinner who is a wretched over and over, up and down, all around sinner. You love me enough to die on the cross for me. Hey. How great are you, Lord? If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you're in a pit. You may not realize it. You're in a pit. And Jesus this morning wants to be your Savior. Maybe you're here and you're a follower of Jesus, and you say, I'm still in a pit. Can I encourage you? Just cry out this morning, greater are you, Lord. He's waiting to reach out to you too. What's he saying to you this morning? Are you willing to reach out to him? He's already done the reaching for you. Father, I come to you this morning. And as we come to a time of response in the service, Lord, we recognize how great you are. 
And Father, as we come to a time of response, we're going to sing a song that says, it is well with my soul. And Father, I, I'm not that ignorant that I would think that everyone in this room says, yeah, it's great, man. It's well with my soul. Yeah. Father, I know there are people that are in the pit. I know there are people that are struggling with different issues in their lives. And I thank you that you are God and you know those issues already. I pray that those people will reach out to you right now. Lord, specifically, if there's someone, whether watching online, whether in this room, that does not know Jesus as their Savior, they'll recognize, they'll pull out that magnifying glass and see the cross. They'll see the empty tomb. They'll see the price that was paid so that they could spend eternity with you. Father, for others that have trusted you as Savior, that have fallen away, today you pull them back. Reach down to the pit, grab them out, and say, let's go. Father, for others of us, we know there's someone in our lives that are in the pit, and we need to go tell them how to get out. Father, give us that boldness to go and share the hope of Jesus with them. Great are you, Lord. Thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Let me invite you to stand as we worship together. We sing the song, It Is Well. Lane's at the back of the room. If you need to make a decision public, if you need to tell, just admit to Jesus, I don't know you as my Savior, we would love to tell you how you can know him. Maybe you're looking for a church home, a place to worship, to be sharpened as iron sharpens iron, and this is where you feel led. He can help you with that as well. What is it the Lord is saying to you today? Let's worship him. When peace like a river ascendeth my way, when so.
thankful for a God that we can say how great he is. And as a result, as believers, it can be well with our soul. You guys go have a great week. We'll see you all next Sunday. Take care.